Of course, I'd say there are way more open questions than there are answers. And I think that's actually the attitude of, of the scientist and the scientist who actually is pursuing science is that your mind is always open to questions. Your mind is always open to doubt in terms of what it is that your the evidence is showing you. And scientists are all about evidence. And I'm reminded if we go back a few centuries, the philosopher Leibniz, uh, who turned over many of these questions in his mind, asked a really fundamental one, perhaps the most fundamental one, is why is there something rather than nothing? And then there was Wittgenstein who came after that and said, well, there's something because there is. <laughs> we can't argue against it. There, we, don't, we have no experience of nothing. Therefore, whatever the world is, is the case. So it's a pointless question. Leibniz said it's an unanswerable question. And it's unanswerable because the only answer is it's the way God wanted it. Now, it's interesting to me also that in scientific research these days, uh, I was reading a book by Harold Merowitz uh, called The Emergence of Everything. And there's a body of uh, scientific investigation which is asking the question, how could the complexity of the universe arise without a designer or without, without the hand of God? And I... I would submit that the scientists who are pursuing what they might call the godless universe are not engaged in trying to show that there's no God. They're not, th that question would be outside of their realm. They're trying to explain how what they call self-organizing systems arise. And a self-organizing system, I would give you an example would be a termite mound. Um, when I lived in Africa, I, I would see these mounds that are about four feet high built around a tree. And this was the colony for hundreds of thousands of I don't know, millions of termites. And a termite by itself, if you were to hold one in your hand or watch it crawl across the table, they're not particularly bright. They've got a brain many size smaller than an eraser and they don't particularly seem to have any purpose or guidance or intelligence when they act individually but when they act together and they follow the chemical trails that are being deposited by the one in front of them when they are uh, tending toward um, uh, finding food to feed the the queen, just as there is in an ant colony, there is a queen in the termite colony. Somehow these amazing structures get built. Now, I suppose we could posit a god who uh, uh, is aware that every sparrow falls and runs around making sure that termite mounds are constructed correctly. But it might be more reasonable to think that, that God in putting the universe in place put certain self-organizing principles in place in terms of physical laws that actually require that structures can only occur in certain ways. Let me give you another example of self-organization, and that is what uh, the phenomenon of flocking. And if you haven't seen it uh, in nature, perhaps you saw it on National Geographic, as you'll see a flight of birds. And there are some bird species who fly in in very close formations, and they seem to turn on a dime, and they, they fly off here, and, and they, but it, it seems as though they're, they're one, con, one consistent organism, that, that they're, they're being directed consciously. But in fact, the birds are like the termites. The birds are simply, each bird is following its neighbor, and they're trying to avoid predators and they're trying to go in the direction of whatever it, it a, a nesting place or or food or you know they're they're trying to get somewhere 
but in terms of how they get there, there's no pilot to the flock of birds. There is no hand directing the flock of birds. It's simply the group organization of and, and structure of their uh, uh, of their flight. And so I see we are get we are joined by the author of God's Existence, Gary R. Lindbergh. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, I appreciate uh, you having me, and thank you for taking time to talk with me. Well, you know, I wanted to get to this this question of uh, this, this deep philosophical question of Leibniz, which actually was something you and I were discussing before, in relation to the Big Bang. Why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> Does that trigger any thoughts? Well, it, it seems to me that that uh, Professor who, uh, who I learned from suggested, how can you have a big bang if there's nothing to explode? If if there is something to explode, uh, that that's uh, obviously uh, uh, possible. But then it raises the question: Well, who created the material that you can explode? And then who created the explosion? Indeed. So we, there, there are some other questions that arise when you start saying, well, a Big Bang created. Well, OK, but who created the Big Bang? Who created the material? Well, if there was no material, how can you have an explosion? Well, Leibniz, the only answer that Leibniz could come up with was because what God wanted it that way. So, I mean, you know, he would agree with you on that point. But, you know, I did a little bit of digging since you and I talked about this. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and I, I, att I actually attended a panel discussion. This was at the uh, Los Angeles Times Festival of Books just uh, last week. And on this panel, it was a bunch of uh, scientists, actually, who were talking about um, their various research. And this young woman, uh, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, and she's actually Margaret Prescott's daughter. She's, uh, I believe, I, I believe Margaret Prescott's on NPR. I'm not not quite sure with her career, but Chanda's area of research is dark matter, and you know, dark matter is evidently, according to the way the equations work out, about seventy percent of the universe we can't see or detect. The only reason that we know it's there is it doesn't interact with light at all, but it does exert gravitational force on on the things that we can see. So it's its influence is rather indirect. Well, this is this is Chanda's research topic, but here's what she says. And guess what? She's agreeing with you. Oh, well, good for her. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, of course, the evidence of the Big Bang is uh, the scientists don't refer to it as the echo of the Big Bang. They call it the cosmic background record, uh, cosmic microwave background, and that is the residual radiation that actually can be measured and detected from the uh, Big Bang. But here's what Chanda has to say: It turns out that we can only explain the patterns we see in the cosmic microwave background by assuming that dark matter was present. If there was no dark matter, the cosmic microwave background data would make no sense. <laughs> so okay. she, she's, she's agreeing with you. So, you know, I, I, I think the point that I wanted to, to uh, explore was, I don't know that, that any of these scientists are really setting out to disprove that God exists. What now the inquiry in terms of Big Bang is really they get theoretically they can get back to a bit a bit after the Big Bang, whether it's a number of seconds or a number of years or a number of millions That's of years. Point. But they don't really know if from the point of origin, if there really was a, a point of origin, they don't really know whether perhaps even physical laws arose during that time. In other words, yes. what was what was the physics during that time, and 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 I think also an interesting way of thinking about this is, and you were talking about complexity uh, the other week, about how complexity arises, and I would say that one of the things that I've been reading in terms of the uh, what the again this principle of self organization and how how complexity arises is that 
it turns out, at least uh, this is what's being proposed in, in, in the theories, that because of the way physical laws are structured, things can only organize in certain ways. And I would say that actually it may just simply be a distinction of language is we have a physical law, we have God's will. Well, those are the same, <laughs> the same thing. And again, if you're talking about a, the, a, a designer, an instigator, then if, if, uh, if a physical law says this can only arise this way, then I would agree that if, if this is God's universe, I think you have to play by God's rules. <laughs> well, think, same, yeah, it seems to me that if God has uh, uh, created the laws of science, then that's the, one of the tools he uses to help in creating everything. Indeed. And indeed. He, he established those rules to start with, probably. And so, therefore, he followed them and uses them. And so uh, uh, it seems to me that's fairly clear. And I would then wonder if I go back, is the story that the Red Sea parted, is that a metaphor or is that something that actually happened? Because I think that there is a belief that, that God can do anything. And I would say, God, my, my, my feeling would be God can do anything within his universe according to the laws that he decreed so if the red sea parted there had to be a physical way that it occurred well god created the laws that doesn't mean that he can't override the laws or he can't uh, part the red sea i would say I mean, if god if has you have to understand that he's if he is has all power then he can do anything he wants well i would think if god overpower if god has to, if god has to break the rules i would think you would have to create another universe to do it in i mean that would Why? be why is it his rules or your rules no no i'm I, it's it's the rules by which this particular place runs you know? well okay but <laughs> god has all power so he can do whatever he wants and uh, including parting the red sea yeah okay okay i, I we, we we will and, we will agree and perhaps we'll agree disagree on that point okay well okay whatever <laughs> Uh, I wonder, uh, Gary, if you've been following uh, the news on um, the fact that the most powerful telescope ever uh, uh, built is now a million out, mil million miles out in space, and about ready to be turned on. Yes, mm -hmm. sir, I have. First, my brother was an aeronautical engineer for NASA and uh, launched the. He developed, helped develop the rockets that put the saddle the astronauts into space and some of the satellites as well that's very cool that's very cool so and, i'm uh, interested obviously well they put it out there at what they call the lagrange point which uh, again like i said it's about a million mi miles out and that's the point in space where the gravity between the, the the sun the moon and the earth appears to be balanced in other words you you can you can stay in that or or it without expending a lot of energy for a very long time and okay. some of the, some of the nasa scientists are are advocating that if we're going to put space stations out there they'll go to asteroids so that we can mine the asteroids and whatever that's that's the place to put those space stations and then of course there's some sci-fi fans that say well when you get up there you're going to find that there's <laughs> there's some spaceships parked up there already uh, <laughs> we would we we would see whether that would occur or not. But the thing that the, the serious um, will um, point about the James Webb tel Telescope is, it is designed to look as close to the edge of the known universe as it's possible to look. And of course, as you look into the depth of the universe, um, the the starlight shifts further and further toward the red, the faster and faster the, again, the result of the explosion, the, the, the stars are moving away. The further you look away from us, the faster those stars are going. So the, at the very edge of the universe, it's really not visible light, it's infrared light uh, that's coming back. And this is the light that that telescope is supposed to measure. Well, the goal of that telescope 
presumably is to look at the very not the very oldest events because we you know we're looking back in time we're looking back at how how the early stars formed and and hopefully we'll be able to see some planetary systems and see how those planetary systems formed so um, it was interesting in this same panel discussion one of the scientists said you know uh, in in physics we used to be working on problems that had practical application because the government wanted to build you know power plants and bombs okay but we're way past that now and he said actually the funding for the james webb telescope is much more like the funding for humanities because it's really just it's really just asking a physical philosophical question of you know, where did we come from? It's not not like that. There's going to be a lot of practical. Uh, you know, we're not going to get Teflon fry hands out of this. You know, no, probably not. But it is a, a very serious uh, attempt to learn more about the universe. And uh, as you were indicating, we probably don't even begin to understand how big the universe is and we are, aren't even close to examining the most extreme uh, ends of the earth or i mean the universe so uh we, we i don't know it'll be thousands of years maybe before we actually even see the end the extreme part of the universe but uh, uh it's still interesting and we're still making steps so we're progressing well, the last, the last calculation I saw was that, um, you know, the universe being 14 billion years old, they estimate, uh, that the width of the universe, if it was expanding in all directions, would be some 30 billion light years. So you're looking, when we look out in space, even beyond just the barely visible stars, we're looking at, we're looking at places that don't exist anymore. Those stars have long since burned out. And we assume that other stars came and, and were built in their place because, you know, stellar evolution, they, you know, they come together, they, they, they cook mo the molecules that make our bodies and then they blow up and then that cools and it comes back together. And I think they said our sun is a fourth generation star. It's about four billion years old. And, you know, because we've got elements like uranium, which are extremely heavy, that, that took several generations of stars to cook. You know, the, the early stars are just simply hydrogen that makes helium as it comes together. So um, the other thing I wanted to share um, was... A, a fact that I came across again, I think that you'll find um, harmonizing with some of the things that you said is I was not aware that there was a competitor scientist along about the time of Charles Darwin, Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace. I don't know. I don't know if you heard this story, but uh, he was a field researcher in the Pacific and they were working on the idea that how come there are all these different species that they seem to be similar, but they're not quite the same. And he, he evidently came up with substantially the same conclusions that Darwin did, that, um, that, that the process of evolution is, mirrors what happens inside a woman's womb. In other words, you could go from single cell to more and more complex structures and that yes um uh, competition for resources and survival depends upon uh, the ones that survive but the interesting thing was that alfred russell Al alfred russell wallace disagreed with Dar darwin and he said well it's not just natural selection there is purpose here and it wouldn't it the 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 evolution wouldn't be able to occur if there weren't some overriding purpose some some physical laws that were guiding it in that direction so um, uh, it it was interesting that he was his views were suppressed somewhat because the in the victorian age 
the the Royal Society, if you will, the establishment uh, was was doing. They felt that there was there was too much theology embedded <laughs> in science, but this this was these were personal opinions. These were not scientific opinions, and so uh, uh, Russell Wallace was marginalized somewhat. Uh, and it and the, actually, what I read was it was act, it was called the Darwin Wallace theory for years until you know Wallace was kind of suppressed. But um, oh, that's interesting. I I hadn't really read that much about it. Uh, I I might have read a reference to it, but I don't think I don't remember. Um, but it, it, one thing that I think we ought to realize is that uh, Charles Darwin's theory was, I think, published in 1859. And uh, I mean, that's like 163 years ago. Is, is it not true that we've learned uh, a lot about science and, and evolution mm -hmm. since then? Is there any possibility that we might have realized that uh, uh, there might, that might not be true? And I think uh, I, th I think the 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 feeling, or again, like like I said, I, this this book of uh, Morowitz, the emergence of everything. He's not the only one, but I, I found this to be um, the most the most interesting discussion of it. And like I said, he's a biochemist, and and his expertise is in how you get from inorganic molecules to complex. Um, um, let's say single-celled uh, living organisms. But yeah, the answer is yes. This this whole question of self-organization, I mean, it, it, it's almost as if it says evolution has, has a right notion, but it's, it's a rel relatively primitive theory. And uh, Mor Morowitz talks about um, emergences and he identifies i think it was like 23 different phases from uh, simple organisms all the way up to complex organisms and he said at the beginning of each at, at, of each phase th things are, are are yes there's chaos there there are random events but the 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 structures that last the structures that have any longevity are there because physical laws almost require them to be or encourage them to be and he said that in the with the emergence of complexity okay it's like oh there it almost it might seem oh anything is possible but actually not everything is possible that be he calls these pruning factors. Okay, if you've got this universe of possibilities and these these molecules are growing all out of control, but it turns out that there's only a few or a few versions of them. There's only a few structures that actually have any possibility of continuing. And we were talking last week about um, the Pauli exclusion principle, the, the rule, and again, call it God's will call it physical law, but the rule that that no two electrons can occupy the same orbit around a nucleus. Well, it turns out, according to Morowitz, chemistry wouldn't be possible. <laughs> it, you would be able to get complex molecules if they could all cluster around the same nucleus, okay? The fact that, that, that mo complex molecules get built of clouds upon clouds upon clouds of electrons gives them the ability to be attracted to each other and form bonds with other molecules and form complex structures that then form, you know, and then you get all the way up to, you know, DNA and all that stuff. But, but I rant on, <laughs> <laughs> as you know, uh, like I said, I, I, as I've told our appreciative audience, um, I, I always have way more questions than answers. Well, that's good. That's the way we, we all learn. And that's what the uh, science is about. Yeah, as you suggested, that we're, it's a process of learning and growing and uh, learning new things. And as you learn new things, you you build up your knowledge and uh, you learn more closer to what the truth really is. Uh, you start off with a thesis and 
uh, as you add um, scientists uh, add their their experiments or observations, they come up with a, a antithesis, and uh, eventually everybody groups around a synthesis, and uh, that that process repeats itself over and over again, and. So every uh, almost every generation is generating new ideas and new thoughts, and that's the, the way we progress. Yes, yes, and and I think we might we might clarify or or emphasize that um, you know I don't know where the idea comes in popular culture that scientists are somehow opposed to the Bible or trying to refute the Bible or trying to somehow knock down religion. But I would say it's more like science, the process of science is for scientists to try to refute each other. Well, that's they're, true. They're, they're in each other's. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens. You're absolutely right. But uh, scientists do uh, make statements. And I read about that with uh, Paul Davies, a uh, couple of his books and and uh, Stephen Hawking even uh, says that the world was re very regulated. And uh, then later on, he says he, he himself said there is no God. He didn't offer evidence for that, but he said it. And I attribute that to uh, the fact that he had Lou Gehrig's disease and became uh, progressively more and more and was so mm -hmm. frustrated, so angry about his uh, disability. But the, the, the thing is that uh, Stephen Hawkins was a miracle in himself Indeed. because uh, <laughs> Stephen Hawking, anybody who's diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, generally, uh, as I understand it, have about two years of life left. Yeah, he lived much longer and, than uh, he was. He lived so to. many decades longer, and he himself didn't connect the dots. He didn't recognize, well, he himself was a miracle. And how do you have, have a miracle when you uh, the fact he uh, did so much, wrote so many books, did so much research, even with all his disabilities. And he even if he took a stick in his mouth and pecked every letter on the computer uh, by 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 m peck uh, search and peck, uh, he was remarkable. And uh, how can you accomplish that when you're uh, you're, you're so disabled? That's a miracle itself, I, I think. And but his determination to to contribute in spite of everything he had, the limitations he had, uh, is beyond belief. And so I uh, I think that his his existence, but he his almost his last breath was uh, there is no God. Well, um, I I think we we can prove that he that he, that was not correct. And I don't think that. Proving God's existence is a complex uh, effort or required effort. I think God's existence is very almost obvious. Uh, it's obvious as a nose on our face because uh, God uh, doesn't have to prove anything. But it, but the irony of it all is that the evidence is so so much uh, obvious uh, that. It's right in front of us, and all we have to do is connect a few dots. But, you know, one of the things that impressed me about Hawking, and uh, I, I, I suppose it may have to do with, you know, the Eddie Redmayne portrayal, you know, in the screenplay, but, um, you know, here he was, he was, all, he was already infirm and, uh, you know, in a wheelchair and not in full possession of his faculties and not only did he fall in love with his nurse but his nurse fell in love with him and they got married and it, from what i understand was they asked her you know uh well you know certainly she may, may she may have felt she had a mission she had a calling you know that that this that this was something way a way for her to contribute to um, to humanity, but her simple answer was, "He made me laugh." <laughs> okay, <laughs> good for her. So there, there's 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 some there's some magic there. Um, yeah, well, well, I mean, and Hawking also said, I mean, and again, this was a later statement as as he got toward the. What became the end of his life is, you know, if the aliens show up, don't welcome them. 
you know, because <laughs> there there have you know we look at Cortez and the Aztecs and and that kind of, and it, yeah. But then again, if we go back to um, even the the precursors of the uh, of the Bible, you know, in in the Judaic tradition, there is the um, the Nephilim and the giants who walked among the earth, and there are the stories of um, of of angelic beings and angels, and um, I I wouldn't rule out the idea that angels and aliens may be more closely associated than we're willing to admit. But, you know, maybe we'll find out someday. And this is one of the things I also, I think that we can agree on in terms of um, a scientific mindset and a religious mindset is that I would submit that most scientists understand the limitations of their areas of inquiry. In other words, you know, Chanda Prescott Weinstein said, well, my field is dark matter. Okay, you know, I'm looking for the particle that is dot, dot matter. Right now there's about five candidates. Okay, well, if you ask her the same question that we let off with, why is there something rather than nothing? She's going to shrug and say, that's not my field. <laughs> they should. Not, that, that's not what I'm looking into. They should and, say that. Well, no, 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 but I mean, she... It, I, I don't know her religious beliefs, but I would not I would not rule out the possibility that she has uh, a set of beliefs and, and you know everybody needs answers to their questions. So I think it's entirely possible that that she identifies with some faith that she keeps in a separate <laughs> separate part of her brain from this technical work that she's doing. Now, you well, know, I don't think one rules the other out. It's all well, I agree with you. I agree with you. They, they should, many of them do, and they should separate them. And if they're going to talk about science, they should present their scientific information. Yeah. If they want to uh, comment about religion, then they should make it clear that that's what they're trying to do. But uh, I, I have no problem with a scientist or an astronaut or uh, anybody who has a, a faith in God and, and but pursues their science uh, or vice versa. If, if they want to uh, expound on it, I just think that they have to uh, be transparent enough to say that this they're speaking as a scientist and this is from their science perspective they this is what they see or believe and uh this is what they can show or, or offer but if they're talking about religion this is another belief or, mm -hmm. and i don't see any con on conflict between the two if if they're honest with themselves and with everybody else that this is how they they look at things well you know supposedly i mean einstein was a very philosophical fellow mm -hmm. And he was asked at one time, you know, well, how do you come up with all this stuff? And, you know, he shrugged. And now, now maybe he was being a little bit facetious at the time, but he shrugged and he says, I just wanted to know how God did it. You know, I, I wanted to understand the mind of God. And, I, you know, and, and then there was also that rather famous quotation, you know, when there, um, you know, Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle, um, there is that there was a discovery that happened uh, some some years after uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity that uh, had to do with quantum mechanics. And it basically said that you, can, you can't really predict the location of an electron until you look at it. Okay, there's some, something about the observation that interferes with the process or fixes the process and Evidently, Einstein said, Oy vey, God doesn't play dice with the universe. <laughs> <laughs> now, but then again, you know, you will have, you will have, um, it's interesting to me how often the phrase quantum comes up in new age philosophy, where you will have, you will have modern day thinkers saying, well, the, the fact that, that looking at it causes it to manifest that that shows the power of mind and that we're co-creators with God and 
you know, we, it, but, but, you know, then it seems like you get to this crazy notion that if you're not looking at the moon, it doesn't exist. But when you look back at it, it does exist. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I can go there. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's people get uh, very active imaginations and they, they kind of create all kinds of images in their mind and, and uh, share it too often with other people. And uh, it, that's part of uh, being human and part of living. And uh, that's part of why we search to further truth. And well, so you, it's good uh, that we are uh, thinking and, and dreaming and fantasizing, if you will, because uh, it, it leads us to uh, pursue our, our interests, whether it's quantum theory or uh, uncertainty theory or whatever. Uh, and the fact that Einstein would say, uh, I want to know what God's what God was thinking is obviously indicative of what his mindset was. And uh, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful that we all have those, all these imaginations and things. And well, and scientific, you know, science fiction literature, I think is a quest for, you know, we don't know the, we don't know what's out there. We know that, you know, what, now that we understand, I mean, when I was, when I was a kid in school, I mean, you know, now I'm really dating myself. I, you know, I was in grade school in the 1950s. The, the science that we were taught talked about the universe in terms of the solar system. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of the universe, okay? I mean, yeah, there's, there's some stars out there, but now we know that there's something like trillions of stars billions of galaxies i mean it, it's just I, I don't know if you've seen that animation on facebook where they start with the earth and then they move out and they they keep building the universe and it's just like there's nothing that's going to make you feel tinier <laughs> than yeah, looking well, at that star map yeah well that's true uh when i visited my brother in huntsville alabama uh i might have mentioned this to you before but yes you did anyway. that's, that's that's the rocket town. That's uh, yeah. That's the rocket town. And uh, he, my brother took me to the space museum there, uh, right nearby uh, Marshall Space Center, mm -hmm. uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, if I'm accurate. And uh, one of the guides there told me that there were billions, not millions, billions of stars in our solar system, in our galaxy. In our galaxy, and, look, look galaxies. Galaxies. and there are billions of galaxies in the whole universe. That's a lot of that's a lot of uh, stars around, and so that's why uh, I think that uh, it's not so unfeasible to think that God could could create uh, humans and uh, and different animals and whatever. Uh, he doesn't need to start with a with a microbe and and wait billions of years for that to develop into something or other things, uh, he can do that right away. And uh, so uh, we know that the human evolution started with the uh, Cro-Magnon man and then Neanderthal man and, and then Homo sapiens and then our, our current humans. And so there's evolution right there. Uh, and uh, I think that, that, uh, that God has a sense of humor. Uh, it seems to me that uh, he gave us uh, five senses, uh, you know, taste, hearing, uh, vision, all these different senses as a daily second by second reminder of his existence. That's how he, uh, that's a, his kind of humor, I would say. Well, our senses, you know, and again, I'll come back to something that another scientist said, which is something of a, mind bender if you will uh, jbs haldane said the universe is not only stranger than we imagine it's stranger than we can imagine oh sure absolutely and, and your point about the five senses is really where that's what fits into that statement because in fact if the, the only way that we know anything as human beings is if it's something that is invisible, let's say radio waves, we've got to invent some 
device that will translate that into something that one of our five senses can experience. Okay, so if 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 there's if there's communication out there, if there's some kind of radiation activity out there that we have no way of translating to our meager set of senses, we'll never know that it's there. <laughs> and in fact, and, and you know, I keep coming up with scientists who agree with you, Gary. Uh, Max Tegmark, the mathematician, is among these uh, people who are not whimsically, they're saying that there's so much structure in our reality that we really wonder whether we're in a simulation created by a super intelligence. Now, that sounds kind of silly. I mean, the, the movie The Matrix was all about that, and that kind of that popularized that idea. But if indeed God created our reality as a, a kind of extremely complex virtual reality, that would certainly make the idea of stepping from this life into the next one seem very feasible. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, the, uh, the philosopher Esther Hicks, I attended some of her lectures, and um, she used to deliver lectures with her husband, Jerry. They would go around and they were talking about, they were communicating with higher powers and they were offering wisdom, whatever. But Jerry passed away uh, and she was still very active in the lecture circuit. And she said, Jerry never left me. He just stepped out of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to phrase it. Well, and, indeed. And, and, um, uh, and, and I was reading this, um, uh, this book by, uh, Oh, who's the fellow? Andrew Gallimore, a, a neuroscientist on the way the brain works and has to do with research into perception of how we evidently, the brain has a model of, each one of our brains has a model of the world that we live in. And this is, it works because it, it gives us the ability to, sur to survive in this world. In other words, if uh, it, it, the definition of sanity is if what your brain thinks is out there is correct in terms of if I do this, this will happen. So I've got a good model of, you know, if I, if I aim at my foot and shoot, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know it's going to happen. Okay, that, that model is there. Um, but he's suggesting that there, that's really only one of many models, and that there, that the exist. And he's talking about spiritual existence. He's saying spiritual existence could be in some other notion of the universe that you're you're just simply not plugged into right now. And I'm, you know, I have, uh, I, I think I've explained. I, I was raised as Southern Baptist, and I, you, you might say I'm a Oh, I don't know, new thought practitioner, whatever these days. But um, I have many, um, I have many friends and relatives who, you know, if I attend a memorial service, they'll say, "Well, well, he's with mom now," and you know that that I can understand that that's heartening. I can understand the extent that you know we rejoin. Um, something that we that we were apart from some place we long to go some place we long to be with but also i know enough about psychology and behavior and and what we call personality to to wonder that after this after this form is gone i have some trouble believing that an individual as a personality would be identifiable now that said and again we're going back to heisenberg <laughs> and manifestation is okay if there's an eternal soul that has a sense of humor or that has a personality he may simply have manifested itself in gary Lindbergh. in other words 
it wasn't that your personality goes there it's that it's there formed your personality you see what i'm saying in terms of cause and effect now that's a that's a slippery thing you know we could <laughs> you know which came first the chicken or the egg the, you know the soul or the uh, or the personality um i think that would be an interesting debate um, yes it would uh but i also uh, we were talking about einstein um another aspect of science has to do with um simply trying to either refute or bear out uh the, the theories that have come before and when einstein proposed his theory of relativity uh you know it 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 didn't refute newton's physics but it said well you know that's kind of a narrow newton's kind of a narrow point of view you got to you got to kind of be locked into the earth and what's going on here but you know if you were if you were space voyager or you were traveling between stars or whatever you wouldn't you would the reality wouldn't appear to you that way and one of the things that einstein said was the faster you go now we're talking about really fast speed of light is 186,000 miles per second something like that the faster you go, and, and he said that's a speed limit. I don't really know why he said that's a speed limit, but as fast as light goes, as fast as you can go, which is one of the reasons that that light coming to us from the edge of the universe is from stuff that's died out, because it took so long to get to us that stars don't let, even stars don't last that long. Stars last a few billion years, maybe 100 million years, depending on the size of the star. But if it's, if it's 30 billion light years away, it ain't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay so but but einstein said the faster you go the slower time runs now that seems like it has no connection with common sense at all and yet i ran into a guy uh he was a physicist. this was this was just a few years ago and he said you know one of the things that proves that and i said no and he says every time you use gps on your phone every time like, you use what every time you use gps on your phone oh gps okay yeah because see this the satellites that that support gps that are that are being the fixed point that the navigation is occurring by those are geosynchronous satellites those are the high, highest flying satellites there are not quite as far as the James Webb telescope, but you know, quarter of a million miles. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I so got so it. they're they're hovering above the Earth. Well, because they're so far above the Earth, they're going around, making making orbit of the Earth as fast as the Earth turns, which means they're going many, many, many more times faster than the surface of the Earth because they're they're way out there. The size of their orbits is so huge, so time is running slower on that gps satellite than it is here on the ground versus so what happens is when your phone pings that satellite or pings the server that pings that satellite the satellite's got to do a calculation that says oh i've got to slow it down for those guys and it actually slow <laughs> slows its clock or slows the calculation for its clock by i don't know maybe even a few nanoseconds but it's there is a they act the scientists who who developed this engineering actually got it wrong the first time because they didn't take it into account that the time was running slower out there but they did you can you, a gps um a military gps can can spot you within four feet of where you are on the earth now, consumer you're not it's not supposed to be that accurate well i don't know maybe not for self-driving cars they do <laughs> we, you, you do have to get it pretty close so um uh but i thought that that was you know good old einstein would say yep good analogy <laughs> yeah uh but i you know i think it's great fun and i you know coming back practically to you know we're we're just talking about the world we live in uh one of the mantras uh, of this show is you know debate is a glorious thing uh <laughs> discussion and 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 disagreement if you will and as long as it goes into you know some kind of rational discourse about well what do you think what do you think and i really do feel that the most valuable thing 
that you can teach a child is curiosity mm -hmm. and 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 encourage that curiosity because if you if you can instill curiosity all you have to do is point them to well not even the library anymore just you know here's a laptop <laughs> okay <laughs> go ahead and dig and i i i worry that if we're if we close off our instructional curriculum to say well you know you can't teach that or you can't say that or you can't make children aware of this then i think you do i mean one of the most valuable things I, and i i didn't really didn't learn to argue either side i i was in debate club in in, in high school uh, and i i eagerly took to that and 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 then later in in college in the type of um instructional program i was in we really were taught to argue either side with that disconnecting from our emotion as much as possible now that's not always possible <laughs> no it's sure. not always possible I, I i admire people on on debate teams who can look at an issue and and argue each side both sides uh and come across with, lawyers <laughs> they're taught to, to look at the arguments and and present the basic information on one side and then they turn around and they do exactly the same thing Indeed. for the opposite point of view that, that and is so admirable remarkable so admirable and, and you know the anecdote about that is like you know um I was I was in the debate club in uh, it was Howard County Senior High School in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland, and the thing was that we were going up against schools that were from Fairfax County, uh, uh, you know, suburban DC, these, uh, Bethesda, Rockville, Maryland. We we're talking about, you know, where the the gods of politics and their children lived. Okay, I mean, you know, very well-funded schools, and at the I, Howard County is a little bit more prosperous now because of Columbia. But back then, we were—I wouldn't say we were a rural school, but we were certainly an exurban um, school. And so we had a very limited budget for everything that we did at the school. But the debate club had nothing. Okay, it turned out that these competitive high schools that they were as they were as fanatical about their debate club as some are about their football teams so they actually had besides the the kids that you know were allowed to debate that were had had moved up in the club in the hierarchy in the leadership there was a whole army of kids that were doing research for them so these oh. guys would walk in to debate with briefcases literally full of file cards. Oh they, and they had evidence for both. Because see, part of the rules of debate is you're not told which side you're going to debate until you're in the room. The oh. judges are going to tell you. Okay, but my team, after we'd been burned once or twice, we spent entire class sessions after school how will we debate based on logic? Can we win on logic? Can we win? On <laughs> Let's go after them on logic. And uh, the next few debates, we wipe them up. <laughs> because we'd been, you know, I guess you'd say it's like studying chess. You know, you, we, you kind of, okay, if they go here, we'll go there. If, you know, we'll, we'll just, you know, reductio, the Latin is what? Reductio ad absurdum. You, you reduce it to the point where it's silly. Um, and sometimes that works. <laughs> and again, uh, the other th the thing that's kind of interesting about that is the British, the British tradition in debate has to do also with making clever fun of the other side. You know, it's the it's the Monty Python, you know, can we outwit in, in the sense of humor? Can we outwit? the other side and I, I but somehow that's never creeped in to, to American style debating you know maybe maybe it would be a whole lot more fun for our students if it did well maybe uh, but I I um, am more inclined to want to see more logic I, I don't want to try to uh, uh, by humor discredit the other side because I think then you're not uh, you're not raising issue against issue or apples against apples. You're you're starting no. to combine 
Quite the, wit, grapes. The, wit, the wit can be a twist to logic, and then that's what makes it funny, of course. But uh, yeah, no, I see what you're say saying, and I, uh, and I, I would be more than thrilled if if just the idea of serious debate um, was ingrained not only in our schools, but I mean, I'd like to see, I'd like to switch on the television and see, I'd like to see real debate in Congress. All, all I, all I see is rant you know I, I i see one sided monologues you know yeah. and, and 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 i think also it it has to do it has to do with the realities of advertising and and, and social media is that the the sound bite is catchy and that's what people remember and mm -hmm. uh, you know here i am in hollywood and and you know uh, written a fair number of unproduced screenplays and one of the things that my screenwriting instructors would tell me was that you know after they leave the theater the audience will not remember the dialogue the, the audience will really not remember what the actors said to each other but they will always remember the emotion that was yeah. in the scene right. And right. the example that uh, actually um, William Goldman in his book Adventures in Screenwriting gives is uh, so take, take someone like Steve McQueen. A star doesn't want to give a long speech. Stars hate, no, number one, they, they don't want to memorize it. But number two, they want their sidekick to say, okay, here's the plan for, for going into the bank. You know, here's we're gonna, how we're going to rob the bank. And so the sidekick explains all this detail. Steve McQueen says, let's do it. <laughs> okay. And the, that's what, the, you know, the audience remembers the bravery, the courage, the push, you know, the, the guts uh, of saying, let's do it. You know, the plan, you know, that, that sidekick might, you know, they might take a bullet <laughs> in the next scene anyway. You know, there, there was the old, always the rule is when you're sending somebody off on an adventure, always have three of them because you need one for the bear you, you, to get eaten by the bear. Okay. <laughs> you always need three characters. So, um, uh, Gary, you've been extremely generous with your time. And remind us again. Uh, you're, you have a book, I believe it's called God's Existence? Yes, sir. Uh, my book is called God's Existence, Truth or Fiction? The Answer Revealed. And you can find that at your favorite uh, local books, uh, online bookstore, or you can go to my website at GaryRLindbergh.com. That's GaryRLindbergh.com, and you find all the information there. Now, what else will we find at GaryRLindbergh.com? You'll find uh, pictures of my uh, tour when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa. Oh. You'll find uh, my blog. You'll find uh, the two books that I that I published. Well, I we will save that for another time. I spent two years in Kenya, as you may know, and uh, I, I wasn't with the Peace Corps. My my wife was doing some 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 um, some worthwhile. Uh, work but uh, uh i'm i'm reminded of chris matthews uh newscaster who was uh, you know i think he was in peace corps about the same time uh you were and oh, really? uh, yeah i my my draft number was six during the vietnam war and i oh, wow. i was actually asked to report i i i suppose i would have gone i i but i'd had um an illness that uh, uh the 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 first physician I saw in, in induction said, oh, no, that can't be the case. You've got to be faking it. And, well, when uh, I was in the, uh, the Peace Corps, I was, of course, deferred. And then when I got out, it wasn't a month or so later that I was, in fact, drafted. Mm -hmm. And it turned out I didn't uh, uh, go to the Army. I uh, volunteered for the Air Force, and they said their quota was full. So then I went to the Navy recruiter and they said their their quarter was full, but they'd ask a neighboring city if if there had any opening, and they did. And I said, "Okay, uh, sign me up." I, I didn't ask for what benefits you're going to give me, how what kind of special training you're going to offer, anything like that. I just I went, and, and it turned out I reported to Los Angeles on the same day I was scheduled to report for the Army physical, but I was reporting for the Navy, mm. and I told the the Navy. 
the people there to please tell uh, the army that I'm here for you, the Navy. And uh, so far to this day, nobody's come to arrest me for being AWOL. So I guess they got the message. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, uh, Gary. And uh, that sounds some of those um, some of those stories. I think uh, we'll we'll want to get into. I'd really like to hear about some of those experiences. So, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, taking the time to talk with me, and I, or the time you did take to, to talk to me. And I appreciate uh, our general discussion, and uh, I appreciate uh, that so much. I'm honored to be among, with you, uh, a very accomplished author of so many books, and uh, it's 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 really. Uh, um, a great privilege and I appreciate it. Well, it's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.